I'm just going to give you a little information before Cheryl comes and speaks to us tonight about her. Reverend Cheryl Ann Beals is the Director of Clergy Formation and Wellness for the Convention of Atlantic Baptist Churches and former pastor of Victoria Road United Baptist Church of the African United Baptist Association, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. She has been in ministry since 1987, including missions in Carolina, Brazil, Christian counselor, pastoral support, Canadian ministries manager, and manager of global discipleship for Canadian Baptist ministries. I'd like to be able to explain to you what each one of those are, but I can't. <laughs> Cheryl Ann is a graduate of Acadia University with a Bachelor of Science Honours in Psychology and a Bachelor of Education in Special Education. She also holds a Master of Education degree in Counseling from the University of Western Ontario, London, Ontario, and a Master of Divinity degree from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Presently, she is working on her Doctor of Ministry degree at Acadia Divinity College. Her passion is to live in a growing freedom in Jesus Christ and assisting others to do the same, especially Christian leaders. She has a desire to see healthy spiritual leaders and healthy spiritual communities wherever people are set free and equipped to follow Jesus, even in the midst of difficulty and suffering. She takes great pleasure in watching people and things grow. Spiritual conversations about how God is at work thrill her. She enjoys spending time with friends and family, gardening, especially veggies and herbs, and thrift shopping, and getting away with God on retreat. Most of all, she loves Jesus. Amen. I'd like to welcome Cheryl Ann Field. Yes, Pastor Bill is about to make an open him. I'm enjoying those very long. <laughs> and uh, I must say, she, she's very determined to keep, keep on being my pastor. Because she pastored me at Victoria Road United Baptist Church. Now she's responsible for clay deformation. So I can't escape her. <laughs> and uh, one thing she tells me, Emmanuel, this year your wife must come or you go and join her. Oh, well, Pastor, my wife is coming next okay. month. I'm going to see her. I'm happy. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, now, please minister to us as a Lord and thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back with you. Um, you're here in September for his induction service, and you've been taking good care of him, I can tell. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, in my role of working with clergy, uh, working with our pastors and encouraging them to take care of their spiritual well-being as well as their health and other aspects. And sometimes they're taking care of everybody else, but they don't take time to take care of themselves. And so I'm the one who gets after them. And uh, when I meet with the pastor's spouses, I usually say that my job is to tell them to listen to you. <laughs> that part they like. Um, an anniversary? It's a very significant time because it's a time when we need to stop and evaluate. It's very significant for us as Christians to take time to stop and evaluate where we are. And so I want to, to talk with you a little bit about that. And I also want to first, uh, before I forget, is bring you greetings on behalf of our executive minister, Dr. Peter Reed, and our associate executive ministers, Greg Jones, who was here for the induction service. You met him. Um, Garth Williams, as well as our new um, Associate Executive Minister, which is Keith, Kevin Vincent, sorry. And um, there, are there are 449 other Baptist churches that celebrate with you as you celebrate your, your um, anniversary. We have 450 churches across Maritimes, and Atlantic Head, I should say. And so we, we're happy when we see the celebrating of an anniversary because it's really celebrating what God has done, right? Amen. It's all about him and what he's doing in us and through us. Amen. Your theme that you've chosen um, for this anniversary service is Have You Been With Jesus? And so that's the title of my sermon tonight. And I am going to, if you notice, I gave you an insert in your bulletin. And if you have a pen, you're... You could use it a little later on. There's some blanks in it. But I'd like 
chose to read, actually, John 15, parts of it. And I'm going to ask you to read the bold, and I'm going to read the light parts. I hadn't planned on that earlier, but that's okay. I think this will work well. So you're going to start off. And this is God's Word, God's living Word, and His Word to us this evening. So let us read His Word together. So I ask you to read the first verse, the first line bold. I am the true great vine, and my Father is the gardener. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I am the Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command them. I no longer call you slaves, because the master does not call you slaves. Now you are my friends, just as I told you everything that all of them told me. You begin to use me, I will do you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for, using my name. This is my commandment, love each other. The world. If, the, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. But I will send you an advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me, because you have been from the beginning of my This is God's word to us tonight. May his word bear fruit in us. The question, have you been with Jesus? It's really a question about relationship. If there is no relationship, there is no testimony. If we have relationship, then we have a witness and a testimony. The question is, what kind of relationship? You know that the church is called to be the witnesses of God. It's assumed that the church, as a church, we are going to be the people who know what it means to know God, who know him personally, intimately, and deeply. It's not about hearsay, but it's about knowing him. And if you look and read in the Bible, particularly in the book of John, you'll notice that people were attracted to those who knew Jesus, or were attracted to come and to hear Jesus. They wanted a first-hand experience or to be with those who had a first-hand experience. The world hasn't changed. Maybe some don't know that's what they're looking for, but that's what they're looking for. They want to know that there's someone out there who has power, who has power to determine their future. People want to know that there's someone Who's in control? We all worship something. If we don't worship God, we worship science. If we don't worship God, we worship alcohol. If we don't worship alcohol, we worship our work. But we choose something to be our God. Something to put in that place that senses, that holds our lives together. People are searching. And I want to put to you tonight that people want 
to know if they're still witnesses to God. The people want to know, is there still somebody who knows God firsthand? Not just information about God, but knows God. And when people encounter someone who really knows God, they know there's something different. They might not know it's God, but they pick up that there's something different about that person. And so tonight, on this, your 156th century, yes. God needs a church that know him. God needs people who can enter into the community with his presence. Amen. God needs people, when they walk into a meeting, the meeting changes because God is there. Amen. That when they work in, walk into the community, that there's a sense that there's something about them that we bring peace, that we bring joy, that we bring love, that we bring the gifts of God to the world. And the world wants to know whether it knows it or not, it's looking for something bigger. Because everything we're doing is failing. It lasts for so long and then it fails. And we know that we are limited in our power, and in our ability. The church is called to be that body of witnesses. And I want to encourage you, break up the place, but encourage you, and I want to challenge you. Your next 150 years need to be 150 years of being those people who know Jesus even more than you've known him in the past and who are filled with him, who overflow with him. Because that's what our world needs. So let's look at this a bit. The Gospel of John is really a book about relationships. If you read through John, he talks a lot about relationship, particularly relationship with God. And John could talk about that because John had a very special relationship with Jesus. He's thought to be the beloved disciple. The one who was with Jesus always in his very intimate relationship with Jesus. He's also the only disciple that is thought to have stayed at the cross when Jesus was crucified. The one whom Jesus told to take care of his mother. And so he knew Jesus at a deep level. And he particularly knew the value of relationship. He knew that God desires relationship with his people. And that Jesus' mission was a mission of relationship. To once again create that open door for humanity to be reconciled with God. And so he knew that it was important to write about relationship. So he writes more than the other gospel writers about Jesus and his time with the disciples. He writes about um, Individuals who Jesus spent time with, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, as was, as was read, um, the blind man, uh, the paralytic. He focuses on and highlights individuals who encountered Jesus to show that Jesus is about relationships. He also focuses a lot on Jesus spending time with the Father and that the Father and Jesus are one because he wants to highlight Jesus is who he is because of his relationship with the Father. His identity comes from his relationship with the Father. His empowerment to do what he does comes from his relationship with the Father. The other thing that he highlights is that Jesus was confident in who he was. So he actually highlights Jesus' own self-identity was an identity of confidence. He knew the power he had, he knew where he was coming from, he knew where he was going. And so Jesus, as one who had confidence in who he was and his purpose. These three relationships. And if you look in three of the Gospels, it talks about Jesus saying, the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God, that's relationship, heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love others as you love yourself. The love yourself is about having that confident relationship with God, an identity that is formed in relationship to God. 
which flows then into our relationship with others. So how do you know when somebody's been with Jesus? How do you know that? I can tell you, but how do you know it's true? And I suspect if I polled you, you could give me different answers. Well, I want to give you some things to think about. Well, we learned from Moses that whenever Moses went to visit God, there was a glow about him. Right? Have you ever met a Christian that had a glow about them? There was just, there's just something about them that's very attracting and that draws you to them, and there's a sense of they, they glow. There's a peace about them. Now, when somebody spent time with God, they have a peacefulness, a security in knowing all is well, regardless of what circumstances say. There's an inner strength about them. There's a confidence, not in circumstances, not even in their own abilities, but there's a confidence in God. They have a courage that they're willing to risk. They're centered. Just as Jesus, everything about him was centered in the Father, one who spends time with Jesus is centered in him and centered in God. They're spiritually aware. There is a direction and a purpose. There's a sense that God is ordering their steps. You might even think God's spoiling them sometimes. They are empowered by the Holy Spirit. I see that you've been decorated for Pentecost Sunday. I'm so glad to see a Baptist church celebrate Pentecost Sunday. It's such an important Sunday. I don't know why some churches don't celebrate it. It's a wonderful. Pentecost is very important. The Holy Spirit coming is what gave the church its birth. Amen. And we have to celebrate that. The Holy Spirit is also our empowerment to live. It is what... It's through the Holy Spirit that God gives us our salvation through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit also continues to give us what we need to live. To live this life in the midst of a world that's very difficult. So it's important. So one who has been with Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is that in order to be one who's been with God means you need to know his presence. So I want to talk to you about some of the stages of knowing his presence, and that's the fill in the blanks that you have there. We talk about seeking God's presence. I don't think we have to seek God's presence. I think God is very present here. That God is around us. I think it's more about acknowledging God's presence. That's the number one. If we want to know his presence, we first have to be willing to acknowledge his presence. And in John 14, Jesus, it's, Jesus talks about God who is with us. The God who desires to be present with his people. And so we don't have to question whether God is present. The question we need to ask is, do I want to know his presence? And am I willing to acknowledge his presence? God's presence is a reality. God the Father said to Jesus the Son that we might know his presence. God the Father and God the Son sent the Holy Spirit that we might know his presence. It's all about God's presence. God desires that we know his presence. When we celebrate at Christmas, Jesus Emmanuel, it's about God being with his people. Over and over again, he's showing he wants to be with us. Secondly, it's about desiring relationship. God desires relationship with us. The question is, do we desire relationship with him? John talks about Jesus and his relationships to show that God cares about us and wants to be a part of our lives, to be the center of our lives, actually. 
Jesus came to reconcile us into intimate relationship. And if you read John 14, it really talks about an interior God. It's not just God out there. As some of us feel, God is distant and out there. But John 14 actually almost brings a new theology that Jesus brings. Because he's saying, no, this is God who lives in you. And you live in him. You know, so that was new. That was novel. That there would be a God who would choose to dwell in us. And that we would dwell in God. And so when you read about um, the vine, it's very intimate. It's interior. It's a God who is in us. That's very different than God out there somewhere. Or even God just beside me. But a God who knows me intimately and desires that I would intimately know him, that's revolutionary. I think we take this stuff for granted because we've read it so many times that we don't realize how huge this is. So you know, you don't have to worry about circumstances around you. God is in you. Let the storms rage. Let this stuff happen. He's there, with you, in you, always. We just have to acknowledge. If you notice, in John 15, Jesus says to the disciples, I no longer call you slaves or servants. A slave didn't know what the master was doing. A slave also, if they were given a task, needed to do it the best way they knew how. And a slave was worried about doing things in the way that the master wanted so the master would be pleased with them. To be a friend means that the resources of your friend are your resources. So when Jesus said, I call you friends, he's saying, what is mine is yours. That he's saying, it's not the task that's important, it's our relationship that's important. That is what matters. Our intimacy of relationship, of being friends. And we have come so stuck on doing things that we miss this. God is more concerned about his relationship with us. Do you realize there's nothing that we can do that God can't do for himself? He technically doesn't need us. What he wants is our friendship. What he desires is time with us. What he desires is to bless us and to show his love to us. And so it's all about desiring that relationship with God. In Psalm 62, the psalmist says, Oh God, you are my God. If we could truly say that with our hearts. And then he goes on to say, I desire you. My soul desires you. My body longs for you as in a dry and weary land. That sense of wanting God. And I think we need to discover what it means to desire God. Our culture is so big on desiring everything else that we may desire only about things. Desire first and foremost is for God to deeply desire him. The third part is experience. If we are going to learn to be in Jesus, we have to desire and want to experience God. That is an internal experience. It is more than knowledge of God. Knowledge of God, Satan has knowledge of God. Anybody can have knowledge of God. But it's an internal and intimate relationship of knowing God. Of knowing that you know that you know. That goes beyond our minds. Experiencing God is to experience God with our whole being. We think, and that's great, God gave us our minds. In scripture, the mind is both feelings and thoughts. But there's more to us than our brains. There's also our hearts, which is our will and our spirit. 
There's also our bodies. There's also our relationships. To experience God is to experience God in the fullness of who we are and to know God in his fullness in all aspects of our being and who we are. And so, he desires to be in us. Fourth, it's about being transformed. And I love that verse in Romans, which is familiar to you, I'm sure, but I want to read it from the message, because the message uh, always has a little punch to it. And it's on the back of your bulletin there. New life, um, place your life before God, and he says in the message. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. We've been trying to change ourselves from the outside in. The change that we desire, have you tried to change habits? How long does it last? <laughs> Because we try to change from the outside in. But he's saying we need to change from the inside out. Re readily recognize what he wants, meaning God, from you. And quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. At some point later on, I'd like you to read um, John 14 again and count how many times it says, in. In me, in you, in the Father. There's a whole other level that we haven't even recognized spiritually that has to do with that intimacy and inwardness. Okay. The next one, when I do, I lose it, is to give thanks. In Colossians, it says that when we're well-rooted in God, we will overflow with thanksgiving. Something happens to us when we experience God that we want to thank God. Again, if you go back and listen, look at the stories of people who encountered Jesus, that when they encountered Jesus, they are so thankful that they overflow with thanksgiving. And that thanksgiving is they want to serve, they want to do, they want to share. And so we need to be people who are overflow with gratitude and have a desire to honor God and that our honoring God is why we want to serve. And then lastly, it means that we'll want to be witnesses. When God is working in your life, you can't keep it to yourself. You've got to tell somebody. Because it's so is bubbling inside of you, you want to share with someone. And it's not to beat them over the head. It's not to convince them. You just want to share because it's something important to you. And you want others to know about it. And sometimes the sharing, you're using, talking about God, sometimes the sharing is just because you want to bless others because God is blessing you. But the most important aspect of being with Jesus so we have a witness. Because that is what our purpose is, to be a witness. That's what God has called us for, to be a witness. But we can only be a witness when we have been with him. And then the last part that I will share with you is what does it mean to be a witness as a church? I've talked about the individual, talked about the church. When we are God's witnesses at the church, the atmosphere of the church is one filled with grace, love, and joy. There's a sense of people wanting to be with one another. God is the center of the community of people and the communion. The relationships are important. People care about each other. There's a sense of joy and welcome to others. People know and love God, and you can feel it, experiencing it. <coughs> Individuals spend time with God, as well as they spend time together in his presence. 
There's a desire to know God's presence and to be sensitive to him. There is a belief.